using him as a nice little support base to sit and sun itself whenever the water gets that little bit too cold. Now we see this hippopotamus here pretty much every single day. I don't know if it's my imagination, but his eye on his left, well, on his right, our left, seems to be really red. Am I imagining that? I don't think so. Perhaps it's just the way that he's blinking and closing it. I wonder whether or not he hasn't been slightly injured in some kind of fight with another hippopotamus. Now he's here pretty much every single day, using Buffle's Hook as the only place, is, is the only place that he can come and seek shelter from the hot afternoon sun. And every now and again he'll give a barrel roll, and the white splodges around his shoulder suggest that it's not just his terrapin friend that has been utilizing him as a resting point, but also perhaps a bird as well that has decided to leave him a token of their gratitude in allowing them to sit on his back. There seemed to be something really strange about his eye. Maybe it's just the angle and the way that the sun is hitting it. A buffles of dam? Mm, I wouldn't call it much enhanced by the rain that we had the other day. A couple of nights ago, for our newer viewers, we had about 15 or so mils of rain, which was very much welcomed by all of the animals and the human beings out here, since we have, I think the last time we saw rain of that to that extent was around March sometime, which is relatively normal for our dry season, but factored on top of a very dry wet season as well and it was a pleasure to have a little bit of moisture. That being said, Bufuzuk Dam isn't really looking all that full. It's starting to turn muddy once again and I wonder whether we'll see any remaining fishes that might have survived the last time that this dam dried out. Perhaps some of the catfish under the mud, perhaps we'll see them once again as this dam starts to dry out. I've just been checking really carefully in the shade. I've just had a report come through from one of the landowners that they found a kill after the sunrise safari that was finished just off a central road along with some lion tracks, which is very, very exciting. And I was hoping perhaps the lions might decide to come and pay a visit to Bufflesook Dam to have a quick drink. But if not, we're going to go and investigate wherever that kill site was and see if we can't work out where the lions have gone from there. That would definitely explain where the lions have been if they've been hiding on a kill on the eastern boundary of Juma. I think that might be something nice for us to go and investigate. And we shall... And welcome to Mary on our sunset safari. Mary has said, well, don't hippos live in groups? This must surely be a male, and the females live in the groups. Mary, kind of. So hippos are really quite comfortable with being gregarious in a pod. You'll even find there's a couple of large bulls in a collection of hippos. But when the water levels start to drop and space gets more limited, the bulls in particular, you are right, by the way, it is a male, um, the bulls in particular start to come into conflict with each other. But Mary, the reason this hippo is alone more than anything else, apart from the fact that hippos are not getting on with each other because they don't want to share what little water is left, is because these, all of these water holes are artificial. They were built when the Sabi sand was opened as a game reserve. And what that meant was there were big dams where there didn't used to be big dams and therefore there were big hippos where there didn't used to be big hippos, which has been fine in our years of plenty rainfall, but has been less fine in, during the drought period where they haven't been able to, or they would definitely not have survived. And what the Sabi sand did was actually capture most of the hippopotamus in this area, put them through passive capture, so no active capture, passive capture by putting up nets and bales of lucerne. They then transported them to a part of the country that has had far more rain and therefore has far more water for them to be at home in. So it's because there's so little water and because most of the hippo have been removed that we're only seeing one alone in the dam. It is quite common, you are right, the, the females will be more gregarious and it will be more likely to see a male on his own, 
But to be honest with you, to be completely honest with you, the hippo dynamics of this area have been completely topsy-turvy since I arrived here. I don't know what they were like before, I can only imagine. But when I arrived here just over a year ago, this dam was f had far more water than it does now. It's slow, or the slow impact of this drought has been relatively terrifying to see, especially on the animals like this hippo. And unfortunately for him, that's it now. As far as I know, they're not going to remove any more hippos. That will be it for the foreseeable future. And these chaps will just have to eke out a living or eke out a, a way of surviving in whatever water they can find. There are still pumped dams, though, for them to seek res refuge in. For example, Red Dam is on Arethusa is looking amazing. It's got lots and lots of water, the perfect hiding hole for a hippopotamus to sleep in and to shelter himself from the sun. Janet, welcome to our Sunset Safari. And Janet, I think, might be new to our safaris. I don't think I've heard your name before, so it's lovely to have you asking questions. Janet would like to know what our hippopotamus will generally eat. Uh, he is going to sleep his way away throughout the heat of the afternoon. Then as it starts to get dark, he's going to head out and he's going to go and eat whatever grass he can find. So hippos are pure bulk grazers. They eat grass, which does explain why they're active far more than they might be during the winter months because they actually have to try and sustain two tons, two, two and a half tons of bulk on whatever grass they can find. And I have to tell you, there's hardly any grass. There is barely anything left. If I look across now to the northern side of the dam, I actually barely see a blade of grass. So how on earth these animals are managing to survive? They're having to cover enormous distances at night to go and find grass to eat. And I imagine they're doing a little bit of browsing as well to supplement because the trees are the only things with any nutrients left. And we've still got a little way to go. And by a little way, I mean at least two months before the grass starts to grow back and it's probably going to be even longer. They're going to have to, as I said, cover enormous distances. We're going to move away from the sad state of affairs with the animals and the drought, and we're going to go and see what those lions have been up to. They have been dancing merry circles around us over the last three days. Let's go and see if we can't find them now. And while we do that, I believe that Brent has been hearing reports of different things on Cheetah Plains, but you don't have to take my word for it. You can go and hear it from him. So the report from Cheetah Plains is that there's a starling feeding or hunting in the leaf litter. It's a cape glossy starling, very beautiful bird. <laughs> I wonder if there's some termites under there that he's found. What do you find there, starling? It's such a striking bird with that orange eye and that iridescent colour. Be quite aggressive towards other birds, darling. And you need quite almost almost a a bird bully. We saw one of those yesterday as well. It looks like that little patch of leaves is uh, not too interesting to the styling anymore. So let's carry on. So I've just got another report about those sticks lines in Mala Mala. So unfortunately I've I'm about 90%, 95% certain that they're not going to come back across. So we're going to go now down into the west, western corner of Cheetah Plains, an area we drive too often, and to see if we have any luck there. If no luck, I think we'll go try help Jamie find those dancing merry lions of Juma.
she had that calling. It's a red crested Quran. I'm hoping it does its suicide dance. It's the right time of the year. Okay, sometimes when you start up, it sets them off. I want to take off suicide dance. No. Nope. Well, we're going to see if we can try spot it now. Sounds like it's around that big termite mound in the distance there. There he is, I think. No, not. Stick. They can be quite tricky to spot. Nope, unfortunately not. And so we're going to keep cruising around. Just check into this western sector where we don't go very often. And then uh, no luck, head back to the northwest. Find that red crested Quran on this road. It's maybe here. He's calling somewhere in this vicinity. No, he's a bit far further into the block. Let's continue on towards the southern boundary of Cheetah Plains and then we're going to head west. Now, let's think. I think if we think like an animal, maybe one will pop out. But while we, Dave and I, try to think like a leopard, Let's keep you guys busy with a little quiz. Hmm. What should we quiz today? Oops. Ha! I've got one. What is... And... Oh, it's a, it's a multi-point question. In what country is the highest recorded leopard and where exactly was that leopard recorded? Uh, what country was the, uh, the highest altitude a leopard was ever recorded in and uh, where in that particular country? It's quite an iconic spot. So uh, I'm sure someone out there must know that. And if you know the answer to that, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Country and the area that the highest ever, at the highest ever altitude a leopard was found. Uh, and also you can send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv. Well, while we fly to the west, Jamie's got a big bird who's doing some flying of its own. I do have something enormous flying in the air and Jandre is doing an incredible job of managing to keep it on your screens. I have to tell you, I don't know what it is. It is totally pale underneath. Initially I thought Marshall Eagle, but Marshall Eagles have brown wings underneath them when they fly over. Oh, there's actually, there's two. I mean, it's definitely not a vulture species. It's very white. Also, the sun is very bright where it is. But I couldn't tell you, I don't know which bird of prey this is. I need to come and land. It's big. It's one of the bigger eagle species. 
look like maybe a juvenile marshal. I don't know if juvenile marshals have completely white under their wings. Oh, and it's gone. Well, if any of you have any suggestions, and perhaps you could see it. Apparently you can see it slightly better than I can. I think it's a juvenile marshal eagle. It's big enough to be a juvenile marshal eagle. It's definitely not an adult, because an adult have brown adults have brown underneath their wings I'm relatively certain just in terms of size I'm also now blind not blind but um, I'm definitely been staring at the Sun for too long oh I'm relatively certain though that that was a marshal oh look here oh, sorry they've stopped doing it the go away birds were having a fight which I've never seen before as quite as ferocious as that was. And well, they're still fighting. But I think that we have a winner. It's a pity we don't have Rusty's camera. Right, let's go for now. I do want to get to where this kill is because I'm sure that if there, if it is around here, and these lions must be too. Now it wasn't here this morning, or if it was, it was very well hidden. Which means that we must have missed it, or it's relatively tiny, because the person who found it was out later, after the end of the sunrise safari, so it might have been something small, that the lionesses caught and then ate. But I want to go and just find these lion tracks and investigate. The more I think about it, the more certain I am that it was a juvenile martial eagle. I'm almost positive. Which is really nice, because we haven't been seeing all that many of them. It's the largest eagle species that you could see out here. And they are really, when we say they're enormous, they are enormous. An over six foot wingspan, more than six feet. I think it's actually closer to seven feet. And they are capable of tackling small antelope. They've been known to catch baby impala and steenbok. There was even a recorded case where one caught and broke the back of an adult. An adult impala. Couldn't carry it away and couldn't really feed on it. But it did attempt it. And then there was the rumor, and I'm still convinced it was a little bit of a, a tall story. But there, there is a story about a martial eagle taking a small child as well, or attempting to cra grab a small child. But they are very big birds of prey. Definitely, if you're an owner of a small dog, definitely an animal to watch out for. I know I spent the first few weeks of Lexi's young life, yet Lexi, my Weimarana, desperately watching her and dashing to stand over her protectively whenever an eagle flew over. At 30 kilograms now, she's a little bit too big for even a martial eagle to think about tackling. But those first few weeks when she was bumbling about as a puppy were terrifying. The first animal she ever saw out here was an elephant. She was eight weeks old. And she was so young that she didn't even register this enormous thing next to the vehicle. She just wanted to go back to sleep. Shannon is absolutely not a dumb question. Shannon is watching in Ohio and has asked what I think is a very salient question which is why do most of the animals out here have brown or dark colored eyes? It's because most of the animals out here are daytime or diurnal animals that we get to see. Look at the eyes of a leopard or a lion or a hyena. They might still be brown, but, but they're more with a yellowish tinge. They're much lighter than the eyes of something like an elephant or a hippopotamus. Well, not a hippopotamus, that's a bad example. An elephant or a, a buffalo or any of the antelope species and it's just because it reduces glare. So people with pale eyes can attest to the fact that you often have to squint into the sun on a bright day, whereas 
people with slightly darker eyes have a an easier time of it because light dark absorbs light and white reflects it this is one of their favorite patches According to all reports, this kill, I don't even know what this kill is, or was, but it's somewhere just ahead of us, and that there were lion tracks all over the show. There's lion tracks going that way, all, but they've been driven over. So Sharon, not a, not a silly question at all. It's to reduce glare, it's the same reason why cheetah have the dark stripes that run down the sides of their face, and lions and leopards have the light stripes underneath their eyes to reflect light. It depends on whether your animal is a daytime or a nocturnal animal. Even bush babies have almost orange eyes when you look closely at them. So a lot of the nocturnal species have slightly lighter eyes. But then you also get the, the cases of pigmentation or a a problem with the genetic code in an animal or rare mutations that produce things like leucistic lions which is the white lions and instead of they're not fully albino so they don't have the red eyes and the lack of pigment completely but they get blue eyes and there is a reason that it is so rare and that's because it comes at a huge disadvantage for that particular animal albino animals that are born out here tend to die relatively quickly their skin is too sensitive to the sun and they often go blind at the same time as their skin is damaged by the sun. But leucistic animals have just enough pigment to maybe be okay, but it still comes at a tremendous advantage. So leucistic is a more lightish colored animal, but not fully albino with the red eyes. down a little bit here just in case the like it's just to give me a chance to find another line log basically well, they might have moved off ever so slightly from the kill because they've got cubs with them and they don't want to keep the cubs around. I think that's one of the big reasons why the Nkumas haven't gone to those dead elephants. Is because they've got cubs with them. And they don't want to drag them into a situation that is inevitably going to attract hyenas. Although, with five, all five lionesses there, they would be capable of protecting them. Okay, so in theory... Kill was somewhere here, I believe. Okay, well, everybody help to keep our eyes peeled. I don't see a lion track, and I don't see any off road tracks. Maybe the best thing to look for is some vultures in the sky. That might help us. Or vultures in trees. But if the carcass is finished, then they might have all set off again.
and hello to Jilly in New York and thank you so much for sending through your question about which animals are the most intelligent or the best problem solvers and Jilly it's really lovely to hear from you the answer is the elephants are probably of all of the animals the most intelligent out here I don't think I'm biased when I say that just because they're one of my favorites I really feel I really believe as though they are exceptionally bright and they are known to be good problem solvers they've got a self-awareness they know they recognize their reflections in mirrors which not many animals do most many a lot of animals are inclined to attack their reflection in response to seeing a an animal reflected in it elephants don't do that just like dolphins and the great apes don't do that Monkeys are very, very clever, as are baboons. Spotted hyena have intelligence levels that are, in some experiments, in their problem-solving abilities and their communication abilities, close to, if not equal to, that of chimpanzees. I think this kill was on Torchwood. That makes the most sense. That's why there's off-road tracks here because those are definitely not ours. Off-road vehicle tracks. Okay. Perhaps that is what they were attempting to describe to me. The fact that... And there's the lion tracks coming south. Let me try and... Oh, sorry, there's hyena tracks. Let me try and reposition to show you. And also it gives me a chance to search for where these lions went after this. So there's the lion track right next to, although that's the leopard track. Ah, uh, we've got confusion. That's what we've got. Okay. There's Brent's footprint. Sort of unmistakable. Sorry, Jilly, we'll get back to your question in a moment. That is Brent's very large track. <laughs> There's not that many people. quite a lot bigger and here's the track that we were looking at okay and here's the track with its toes this is not a lion it's a leopard it's the male leopard that Brent was tracking this morning or oh, perhaps I'm incorrect perhaps I'm making assumptions I can see where Brent has marked the last tracks We'll carry on a little bit further. I can almost guarantee the kill was somewhere in here that attracted all of the vultures. And I do just want to double check around that junction just to see whether or not are there are any cat tracks. But before I do, to answer Jilly's question, hyenas in experiments in terms of problem solving have been shown to have some of the best skills of any of the animals out here. Contrary to lions, which... Um, Lions are great and instinctive animals, but they are not the world's greatest problem solvers. They're not, they're not built for that sort of thing. They certainly have a degree of intelligence in terms of their communication and their planning for hunting other animals and coordinating those hunts. And see, I know Brent did mention lion tracks in this area. I'm just going to keep double checking. I'm actually going to try and get hold of him. Let's see if the game drive comms will work for getting hold of him on channel one. Brent, Brent. Nope. Doesn't sound like we're reaching him. Oh, there we go. Never mind. Where was your last set of Ngalo and Konzo? Were they on Cheetah Cut Line somewhere? Uh, so the question I'm asking Brent is, 
where are where was the last that he had a lion track rather than a leopard track where was the last point that he had a lion track this morning because i just want to make sure that there wasn't any confusion but where were the last lion tracks that you had this morning sorry Copy that, thank you. They were further north. Uh, there was a little bit of confusion there between leopard tracks and lion tracks. No problem. And we were called into. I think that kill was the male leopards. Oh, goodness. I think that that kill belonged to the male leopard, not to the lions. And that makes, exa that makes so much more sense in terms of that leopard coming out of that area and lions being a little bit further to the north. I don't know what it was though, so if it was a buffalo, then that would be a different story. So, Jilly, intelligent problem solvers. Apparently honey badgers are very, very bright and are good at solving problems. That's just something that I've heard in terms of the different animals. And I've met a, a semi-tame honey badger before and he definitely was very good. He wasn't tame, he was being rehabilitated into the wild. He was very entertaining to watch, sort of figure out problems and solve opening jars and so on. He was very good at that. And I imagine, I'm not sure about wild dogs, I'm not sure how good at problem solving they are. I don't think they, I think that sort of top categories would be elephant, hyena, primates, but baboons and monkeys, honey badgers. I can't think of anything or any of the other animals that have quite the same level of problem solving abilities that they do. So Bren said the tracks were a little bit further north, coming into the block around here and that they were heading towards Mifflesook Dam. So I think it might be nice for us to just go back and check more carefully around the shaded areas and on the eastern side of the dam to see whether or not those lions have decided to pop up. And speaking of lions and Brent and his tracking ability, let's head back over to Cheetah Plains and to find out how his explorations of the east are going. Well, I've just got a, an update that I, I'm a little bit confused on, but I'm, I'm just going to go follow up on it anyway. Apparently the tracks of a female leopard and two tiny cubs coming from Nkoro into Cheese Plains around here, but I haven't seen any tracks. I've been checking very carefully, and apparently it's Tundi and her new litter. So we were on our way back towards Juma and I got that message so I just wanted to come have another quick look here but I'm seeing lots of kudu around I'm seeing impala so I'm not actually I'm not so sure quick look on that softer sand there see if that tiny little scuff mark is what I think it is I'm hoping it is what I think it is I'm sure you guys are hoping that that tiny scuff mark is what I think it is as well if we know what we're saying now I might have confused myself slightly it's still quite hard after the rain Go look at my scuff mark again. Oops, my door's open, that's naughty. Now it is what I think it is. What do you think I think it is? Dave? 
leopard track. It is a leopard track. It's a female leopard track, but it's very, 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 very difficult to see. Let's go for one last look around three in a row pan. If I don't get anything there, I might just throw the luck dice and walk from three in a row pan directly to where the general direction is. If she's taking the cubs in here, I'm not sure how old they are, but she could be taking them to a kill or she could be stashing them in here. So either way, yeah, I think it's worth taking a gamble. And strange enough, actually, thinking about it, Tundi is a leopard I've never found on foot. Well, well done, Manda. Manda, for that, what is the highest altitude a leopard has been recorded at? Uh, it was in Tanzania on Mount Kilimanjaro. A pastor uh, who used to live there, he part of the ex-Cossack army, then became a Lutheran pastor. Had per he's personally climbed Kilimanjaro over. Uh, he discovered the corpse of a frozen leopard on the crater rim. And uh, it was just under, just under 15,000 feet. Now, a lot of people, of course, said snow leopard in the Himalayas, but the snow leopard and the leopard are two different species. They are obviously the same family, but they are not the same species. Now, we are being gazed upon by a bemused waterbuck. This is now the third time we've driven past that same waterbuck, so I suppose it's allowed to give us a bit of a bemused look. being bemused behind a quarry. Dave? There we go. There is the bemused waterbuck. Maybe not so bemused as saying, what are these silly creatures doing? Round and round in circles. <laughs> Wait a minute. Waterbuck, I'm trying to find leopard and cubs. Give a snort if you spot them, please. Some little birds chirping about. They sound quite upset. What could have upset them? Oh, actually, I know exactly what's upset them. Uh, this is very close to where we saw that slender mongoose earlier, so that's why the little birds are alarm calling. Let's go back and you can spot one. Okay, you got him there, Dave, yes? Um, okay. So zoom and go to the left hand tree, uh, right, so center tree I should have said. Okay, now uh, left a bit and that tree, now center, up, now out and up, oh. so the, down a bit, oh, just, there we go, uh, top left corner. Here we go. Little chin spot bat is very upset about something. Boop. I'm pretty sure that slender mongoose must be around here somewhere. So 
so cool, so cool. Now it's not often, no, I can't, it's so small. So cool, but so small. Okay, there we go. Okay, Dave, this is gonna test your camera skills. You ready? Okay. Because of the rain, sometimes animals that have very small feet leave tracks. Am I too close? Nope. Look at that. Look how cool that is. You can see the toes, the claws sticking through. Isn't that amazing? Now, the next conundrum, of course, is what is that creature? I know what that creature is. That's why I got so excited. It's not a creature you see tracks of very, very regularly. Now, let's think. Maybe you guys would like to guess what little critter that was that made those beautiful little footprints. If you do know, questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Very, very cool little track. One last dash, our third, it's our third dash ready. Once, twice, three, fourth dash past three in a row pan today. And it is empty as it has been the last previous three times we have driven past here. Yeah? Uh, no quarantine bathed in golden light atop a termitaria or in a marula. Okay, come on, Tandy. Where could she be hiding? While well, I go try to figure out where Tandy crossed, let's go see what Jamie's been up to. Hi guys, I just wanted to show you something amazing which is how much green grass has come through since we've had the rain. I mean, it's not bright green, but it is really green. Now, I'm sorry, I was in the middle of uh, talking to somebody on the Game Drive channel, so just bear with me one second while I finish off that conversation. Uh, affirmative, I haven't had any luck. I'm just checking around Bufflesook East now. Okay, copy. Anyway, just a really, it is a really sheltered patch that this particular grass is growing in. You can see it's where water runoff comes flowing down into Buffelshook Dam. A little, a gully, or what we in South Africa call a donga. I don't think the word donga is translatable throughout, away from South Africa. But yes some green growth coming through in terms of the grasses which is really really a pleasant surprise because I didn't think we were going to see any as a result of that rain I thought that it was a little bit it, because of the timing this time of year I really didn't think we'd see much in the way of change at least to the grass side of things but we seem to be it'll be happy news for animals like that hippo that we saw at Buffelshook Dam 
But now we are investigating where these lions have gone. Brent said that there, at least he had one set of tracks coming into this area. This is where I saw the lioness, one, in the direction that I saw that lioness with the two cubs dash past our elephant sighting yesterday morning. And I'm hoping she might have decided to stash them somewhere here. I'm checking really carefully for tracks. And lovely to hear from you, Nancy in Texas, on the subject of our grasses. Now, Nancy wants to know about whether or not our animals eat just the tops of the grass or whether some, there are some animals that uproot them and whether or not overgrazing is ever a problem out here. And Nancy, first of all, yes, there are animals that rip up the grass completely, roots and all, particularly at the moment. Animals like the first thing that springs to mind is an elephant. Elephants have been, if they aren't busy feeding on the trees, then they're busy digging up the root systems of the various grass and smaller plant species in order to get the nutrition that's stored in the root systems. So they have been doing that relatively regularly. Most of our animals, though, nibble the tops of the grass, and obviously grass has evolved to be eaten. So for the last thousand, however many thousands of years, the way that gra grass has developed is it's got growth points at different points along the stem. And so whenever it's eaten, the growth points that sit below it will just resupply that grass, hopefully in the same way that's going to happen with a certain set of sunflower seeds in the camp or sunflower plants, because that is a very, very sad situation where poor Brian lost his, lost his sunflowers to the bushbuck. Uh, we do have, we could potentially have a problem with overgrazing. However, it's important to remember that this grass has evolved, as I said, to be eaten and to be utilized. This whole area has evolved, the balance has evolved with the animals eating them. So the plants, the, the, the trees get eaten by the elephants to stop the woody layer from dominating. And the grass species have been evolved to be eaten in order to propagate. And the only way you get a major problem with overgrazing, which is what we're seeing now, is if you have a drought and you have water holes. So the animal action, the hoof action, backwards and forwards to get to the water hole, combined with the overutilization of an area, can in turn overgraze and overutilize spots around water holes. And in turn, what that means is it takes that area a really long time to recover because the grass species holds the soils in place. And as soon as you get your first big rains, and this is going to happen all around Buffles Hook Dam, as soon as you get your first big rains, if it comes down in a torrential downpour, it's going to wash away the top soil layer. And that top soil layer has been developed over hundreds of years, slowly breaking down the rock beneath the surface of the soil and then getting the nutrients that are needed and then the, the pioneer, the tough grasses start off, they secure the soil, then you get the slightly more palatable and slightly more vulnerable grass species growing, the, peren the perennial plants, the perennial grasses while, rather than annual grasses and so on. So there is a very delicate balance. You see it's not just there. I'm sorry, I'm very excited by this because I'm looking now down onto the ground and I know it's not much, I really do, but look at that. Bright emerald green grass shoots coming through. That really is wonderful to see. Just goes to show how resilient an area is. Absolutely lovely. I'm very impressed and not a little bit surprised, but very special to see. We might even be getting flowers again relatively soon. And then, Nancy, there's also different types of species utilizing the different types of plants, parts. So zebra tend to crop the top part of the grasses, 
wildebeest with their slightly more nimble lips will go and nibble around at the base of the shoots where the most nutrition is short of uprooting the plant. Now that's why you often hear of that symbiotic relationship between wildebeest and zebra. It doesn't mean they can't exist without each other. Most definitely not. And it's one that I think is slightly overemphasized in the basic guiding books, the story that wildebeest and zebra are always together because they eat different parts of the same plant. You don't really see them together all that often out here. But it does just, it is a useful example of different animals utilizing different parts of the grass. No sign of our lions around Buffelsook Dam, in fact no sign of anything around Buffelsook Dam, apart from the new bright green grass shoots, which is really exciting. I have not seen all that many. The antelope aren't around and that's just because there's still puddles of water on the ground. And I think we're going to start journeying a little bit further to the west. I've also spent a lot of time lurking around this area in order to, especially in the evenings, in the sort of hope that all of the aardvark holes that are in this area will translate one day into an aardvark sighting because of course I'm famous, not famous for, but I've never, it's becoming a little bit of a, an in-joke because I've never ever seen an aardvark in the wild. I don't know what it is. I don't know why it is. I have worked in places where I've gone on aardvark captures before and I've just never managed to see them. I've always just, just missed out on seeing them. How's that backlighting going to work? Let's see. Hmm? Beautiful. Sorry, we'll go back to talking about aardvark in the moment. For, the, for now, we've got this lovely waterbuck ram. He is absolutely huge. Not quite as fluffy as some of the other waterbuck that we've seen. But the backlighting does give you a nice idea of just how furry these creatures truly are. Lots and lots of waterbuck around. How many did we count this morning in that herd? It was 15. There's some big groups of waterbuck. And he must be loving the new bright green grass shoots. Perhaps rejoicing in the fact that he has been the first, one of the first antelopes to discover this. I often wonder whether or not the animals know that rain means fresh food. Or if they just take whatever they can get and don't make the connection. I think that they must. We've got some old scarring. Oh, we've got a lovely view of this waterbuck bull, but Brent's antelope are doing something highly entertaining. Look at this incredible dust and impala rams. They were all a second ago chasing one poor female. They got a bit confused, they didn't realize mating season's over. But what they have done is create some spectacular visuals for us with that sun and the dust and the impalas. Come on, chase them again. Make some more dust, guys. It's literally absolute pandemonium going on a few seconds ago. All these males chasing one female. <laughs> All calm now. I 
heavily backlight on those Impala. Beautiful big herd of Impala. But it looks like all the pandemonium is is over. And they've just gone back to feeding. Yeah, there's about 40 around us at the moment. Come on, something spark you into chasing again. It was amazing how much dust in. Oh, here we go. Are we going to go at it again? Boys will be boys. Just heard some of those coughs. Burp. He's going to move off the road. There's a car coming. I'm going to cause a traffic jam. Now, what probably happened is that they picked up the wrong scent from that female and literally sent this whole group of males into an absolute tiz. Thinking there might be one poor female who wasn't impregnated during the rut. Okay, well, it's all over now. Uh, pity we couldn't show you. So we're going to keep moving, and we've got to go through the Mulwanini shortly. So we might lose signal, but you stay with us till we get a bit closer. So I think I finally caught you guys on a track. We had dwarf mangos, a porcupine, and civet, and none of those were correct. Oh. So, back to the drawing board. One of them is in the right area, right family, but none of those are the particular individual. So, as we're about to descend into the Mulwanini River system, and our signal gets a bit iffy, while you ponder what track that could possibly be, Let's go back to Jamie. I wonder what track that is. I'm curious now to find out. Of course, I can't see it from driving about on the back of Wendy, but I'm very, very curious to see if I would get it. Sounds like it might be one of the tricky ones that Brent has pulled out of the hat, so to speak. I've done a full circuit of this area. I, I can't, there's been so much vehicle traffic, I can't find one track to guide me in the right direction. I've got Brent's instructions that they were somewhere here, going in here, but I honestly cannot find a single revealing footprint in the dust to tell me where to go double checking. I might move on for a little bit and start moving along for Central. Perhaps that male leopard that Brent had tracks of this morning might pop out somewhere there. I'm also very curious to see which particular male leopard it is. We saw Tingana two days ago, exactly two days ago, when we popped out at Red, or he popped out at Red Dam actually, to say hello to us all. It felt like it had been forever since we last saw him. And he was looking hungry. He actually, to me, Tingana looked as though he'd lost... Tingana is the male, dominant male leopard in this area, by the way. And to me, he looked as if he was not just hungry, he looked as if he'd lost muscle tone around his shoulders and his neck. And he did have a little bit of a limp. Apparently, he's had a limp for a long time. I've definitely seen the limp a couple of times in the last few moments that I've... in the last few sightings that I've had of him. It's Impala. <laughs> I also got quite excited. There's just something reddish and cat-sized walking across the road, but it's an impala very far away. But yes, back to Tingana. He just seems to have been a bit down on his luck recently. But perhaps this is him now, whose tracks have come out onto Cheetah Cutline and moved back into Juma. And speaking of Tingana, 
which of course means the shy one. And we've been speaking of the Unkahuma lionesses and the Birmingham boys and Karula. Lily would like to know how we go about naming the animals, how we go about coming up with the names of the animals. This idol is set too high on Wendy. I'm going to give that a little bit of a once over later. Uh, so, Lily, the answer to that particular question is it's usually a communal effort amongst the various guides. The pride names are something that have been decided quite a long time ago. So the Inkahumas, apparently the story goes, are called the Inkahumas because they were first seen coming in from Kruger, Kruger underneath an Inkahuma or a brown ivory tree. And I think they were nicknamed that by the guides at the time. Leopard naming tends to be a bit more of a controversial issue. Not controversial, but there's different approaches to it. In some areas, the first people to find the cubs get the naming rights. In others, it is a, an honor given to the longest standing guide or ranger in that particular working team in that area. And then that sort of works downwards. So the, the highest ranking guide will get it and then down the ranks and so on. In this particular area, the approach that we've been following since I started working here is to do it by democracy. So each of the lodges that get to see those particular leopards will put, two, put suggestions forward and it will be voted on. And then that will be either be passed or whichever name is best will be chosen. Uh, generally, we wait until the leopards are a year old before they are named, given their official names, just because their mortality rate is so high before then. However, we have named Karula's cubs before that, since they have become such popular characters of the show and we didn't want them to be given nicknames that then became very confusing for people watching across the world in terms of which leopards were which, which is sort of what happened with young Sindile. So it is a, demo a democratic process, naming the leopards, and it's something that's done in, in attempts to make reference to their characters. Karula means the peaceful one, and you do have to spend a little bit of time with the individual cats to get to know their different natures. Most of the time, you don't name individual lions in a lion pride. But that's something that we've started doing, particularly with the Nkuhumas, because we've spent so much time with them. So in that case, it's actually, this is, this is more a wild earth naming than it is any kind of official standpoint from the other lodges. The same applies to our hyena names. Those are completely names of our own for us and the viewers of Safari Live. And none of the other, other lodges will recognize them or call them by those names. And the same applies to the elephants. We generally don't give each and every elephant a name, which would be impossible. But those characters that we do see on a regular basis, then we do give them a name because we, it's easy to refer to them and to talk about their background in that way. I'm also hoping as it starts to get a bit cooler that Karula might pop out because she did, she performed a mysterious disappearing act this morning or last night. Her tracks didn't pop out onto any of the roads, which leaves me convinced she must be sitting in that drainage line still, where she had the kill, in the Mulwati itself, just hidden away somewhere. And of course you could drive within 50 meters of a leopard, and unless it is sitting upright or flicking its tail, you could miss it completely. Just watching these Franklin, they look like they were about to have a bit of a fight. But they seem to have changed their minds. Perhaps it was just a... a miscoordination of movements. One landed on top of the other one. But I think it was an accident. And some crested Franklin for us. Sorry guys, I was just listening to the Game Drive channel. 
Mike's just calling in a hippopotamus that is out of water, but unfortunately it is on Torchwood. Uh, obviously they have their own resident hippopotamus in that area as well. Okay, decision time. Are we going to go left down Nyala Road South or are we going to go right along Nyala Road North? <laughs> I'm really not sure which... I don't actually think anybody's driven Hyena Road, which also might be a very good starting point, since that's where we last saw the lioness with the middle set of cubs disappearing into yesterday morning. And while I decide whether to go left or right, it seems as though Brent and myself, thinking along similar lines, he's popped into the Milwati drainage line to go and see, I imagine, whether or not that male leopard or Karula have popped out somewhere there. And let's go and join him on the back of Rusty through a river. So we're in that Milwati riverbed, and I'm just checking very carefully I did drive here this morning, so I'm trying to see if there are any leopard tracks on top of where I drove. And that would be very nice. Give us a good chance of possibly finding one. This is ideal leopard country around here. Especially if you've got cubs, there's lots of good spots to hide them, lots of trees, lots of thickets. Good food sources around here, Nyala, Bushbuck, Pala. Hi Marsha, and Marsha's wondering do Impala mate throughout the year or is it seasonal? They are one of our seasonal breeders Marsha and they've just finished the uh, finished mating, it's normally March, sometimes early March, normally April, May and then they're going to give birth. And back across to us in Nyala Road South as poor Brent has lost signal completely in the Mulwati drainage line and hopefully he will be back up and running very shortly. I'm sorry I'm just distracted by this weeping wattle tree. It has been absolutely not quite massacred but close to massacred by the elephants that have moved through this area targeting one of the few trees with properly green leaves left in the area and around it lies the debris of that feeding on also gives me a nice opportunity to just stop and listen one thing I've noticed about the elephants while they're eating this weeping wattle is they are oh goodness sorry I put my jacket around my earpiece I'm all zipped up inside, zipped it up inside me so I can't get out. There we go. The one thing I've noticed a lot with them eating the weeping wattle trees is that they're not concentrating so much on the leaves, which aren't very nutritious at all, but they are spending a great deal of time, if we drag this bit over here, they are spending a lot of time stripping away the bark. 
This is the end result when you next see an elephant. Get off. There we go. Next time you see an elephant, put the branch in one side and then they sort of twist it around with their trunk. And this one's quite heavy, so I can't do it with one hand. They kind of eat away the bark. And it comes out the other side completely stripped of whatever cambium layer it has left. And it just keeps going. And they make it look so easy, but it's actually quite difficult to do. Obviously, I'm not going to try and do it with my teeth. But just in terms of balancing this end. But I suppose having a tusk also helps. So they're after this strip of wood. This, by the way, is the same tree that Ryan used on his interview drive to make string out of. I ended up making a bracelet by stripping away this layer, but he chose a young one. Oh, no, it wasn't, sorry. It wasn't. It was a terminalia. My mistake. It works as well with weeping wattles. It's actually where I was going to go with this. He chose the terminalia. It does work with weeping wattles as well, as well as knob thorns. So they're obviously desperate at this point, because generally elephants avoid the weeping wattle trees. They tend not to have that much in the way of nutrition. And that weeping wattle is going to be fine, but most of its main stem is broken. We've still got parts of it intact, so it will survive the meal of the elephants. We decided to go left, by the way, down in Yala Road South. I'm starting to get lion cub deprivation now. What's it? Withdrawal. I'm having withdrawal symptoms because I haven't seen the lion cubs in about three days. And I haven't seen the oldest set of cubs in what feels like forever. It has probably only been a week, but it feels longer. And I can't wait to find them again to see how much they've grown. I saw Karula's tracks, but it was my imagination. It was just a water buck. And lots of fresh elephant tracks as well, which is good, because this morning we were talking about the fact that we were feeling slightly abandoned by our elephant herds. I don't know where they've been going or what they've been up to, but they have just disappeared. We, the elephants that we saw earlier this afternoon are the first elephants I've seen in well over 24 hours and it feels as though the place goes from teeming with elephants to having hardly any, any elephants left. Stay, stay, stay. <laughs> it was a brave choice. It was a brave and risky decision and it did not yield any results except for the twitch of some ears behind the trees of a grey dacre. a little tail twitching in the distance. So today is small antelope day. Unfortunately catter day, not yet, but catter day hasn't gone according to plan today and it has turned instead into small antelope day because I'm pretty sure I've seen more Dacre and Steenbok today than I have the entire week combined. It seems as though Brent has got signal once again. Let's find out if he's still in the Mawati and what his plans are from there. I am indeed still in the Mawati River. Just double checking. We're a bit further 
to the uh, south from where Karula had her kill. Sorry, I just want to double check a track there. Nope, 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 nope. Come on, Queenie, where are you hiding? So we haven't seen tracks of her anywhere, which leads me to believe she might just be snoozing somewhere in the Mwati River system. Now, it's nice, it's cool. There's lots of little puddles around. There's a diker running across, disappearing. So that's not a good sign when you're looking for a leopard. Off it goes. And we're almost to the end of our Mawati adventure. Is that there is a large tree that is blocked away, but never fear. Hold on, Dave! Are we going to make it? Oh, so close. Oh, that was it. You need a bit of speed in the sand to get up the hill. Uh, maybe we'll try again. Let's get a bit of a run up. Do you think we're going to make it, Dave? I'm not so sure that sand looks quite loose. Let's go. Here we go. So I'll hint that the track was definitely not from a porcupine and it was definitely not from a civet. It was definitely not from a dwarf mongoose, but something that shares a common ancestor with a dwarf mongoose. Franklins. I know Jamie tried to show you some that disappeared. Owls seem to be a little bit more forgiving. Oh, maybe not. Yeah, there they are. It's always good to have a listen. Stop, switch off. Off go the Franklin. They're going to find a spot to roost quite shortly. So even though they're ground feeding birds, they will sleep in trees. Too dangerous to sleep on the ground. Anyway, have our little Frank Lones. Hello, Marsha. Marsha says, oh, well, since you're on the topic of birds, how many eagle species do you get in your reserve? Well, we have migrant eagle species and resident eagle species, Marsha. So, of our resident eagle species that are here for the whole year, we have, what do we have? Let's think. We'll start with the biggest one, Marshall Eagle. Marshall, as in similar spelling to martial law, not, hey Marsh, what's cracking? Um, Marshall Eagle, it's the biggest, it's got a wingspan of over two meters. And uh, what else? Uh, African Hawk Eagle. So we're on two, Battalier. Three, Brown Snake Eagle. Four, Tawny Eagle. Five. Uh, you have the possibility I've never seen one on Juma, but they do. I have seen other parts of Sabi Sands. Uh, a black breasted snake eagle. 
Um, so what were we on there now? Marshall, Basilea, Brown Snake, Tawny, Black Breasted Snake Eagle, uh, Crowned Eagle along the rivers. Uh, Crowned Eagle, so we're on six. I'm trying to think now. I think that's. Ooh, I know Long Crested Eagle has been recorded in the Sabi Sands as well, so that's seven. Oh, I'm trying to make sure I don't forget any resident eagle species. I think that's all, I've got all the residents that stay in South Africa year round. Uh, migratory eagle species, different story. Uh, Warburgs, lesser spotted, booted, so we're at 10. I'm not missing any. Maybe I'm missing one or two, so between 10 and 12, I would say, Marsha. Step Eagle, there we go, 11. So the Sabi Sands Game Reserve is made up of a whole bunch of smaller properties and Michael is wondering how many different reserves make up the Sabi Sands. So my thing is remember there's some commercial reserves and there's some non-commercial reserves. So of the commercial reserves, uh, we're on Juma, there's Cheetah Plains in Koro, Arethusa, uh, Chitwa Chitwa, uh, Sibambili, Elephant Plains, that's in the north, let's drop down one, uh, and you've got Mala Mala, Nandalezi, Singita, so 10, are we more than 10? I think we're 10. Uh, Ulusaba, Dulini, Exeter. What else is in the west? Savannah. Um, might be missing one around there somewhere. Uh, and okay, let's go further south. Then you got Nottens. And 20, Sabi Sabi. 21, Lion Sands. 22, Anum Kombe. 23. So those are the commercial entities that own land. Uh, we're on 23, then we go with non-commercial reserves. And now this means the game drive vehicles can drive on them, but they don't have a lodge themselves on the reserve. Start up in the north, we've got Buffalo's Hook, Torchwood, Little Gowrie, Hoffman's, and Nets, Shirley's. 26. <laughs> this is going to take a while. Uh, okay, now let's drop down one. Now let's drop this. Ottawa, 27. That side's all covered. Dudley, 28. Uh, Beaumont's, 29. I think I'm missing one down that side. Ah, Kirkman's, which is another commercial one, 30. So about 30 reserves. I might have forgotten um, some uh, smaller uh, pieces. Uh, on average, I think most of the properties are around 1,000 hectares, uh, some of them being a bit bigger. Mala Mala, by far the largest. It's around 16,000 hectares. Michael, I hope that helps. I might have forgot one or two. At least 30. Oh, I did forget another one. Now I forgot to remember his name. Down south. 31. <laughs> Just call it 31. Where's Karula hiding? Not a track. Did you hear that, Dave? I was correct. I thought I heard a tree being savaged. Oh, unfortunately, it's definitely not going to be the best visual. just heard a branch breaking and of course they are disappearing into the Mawati River in a section where we can't drive but there is a large grey behind and that is what I heard the noise of elephants feeding Crunch, crunch, crunch. 
Well, hopefully they decide to come back out, but from the tracks I can see it looks like they've come from the open and are heading down into the thickets. Sounds like there's quite a few of them. Mike is wondering, even though elephant bulls travel vast distances, is it do they ever encounter their natal herd? So the horn, the herd they were born into. Mike, I, I, it's possible. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure it is very, very possible that they would, in their wanderings, encounter their natal herd. But uh, to know for sure, I don't know if anyone's ever done any studies on that. There we go, elephants have disappeared pretty much into the thickets. So we're gonna keep checking around. And uh, I'm actually, for once, running out of deer's way to look for Karula. So I think from now on, we're gonna let Dave choose which direction we go. Uh, Dave likes that idea. But then also, if we don't find anything, we can beat him with a stick and blame him for not finding any cats on Catadad. And we'll give you a pat on the back and say, well done, dangerous dish. <laughs> uh, life's not fair, Dave. Okay, so we're coming up towards Vuyatela. Uh, Maybe those elephants will move through the Mawati and chase Kula out for us. Hi Fiona. Now Fiona is wondering what qualifications do you need to be a safari guide and uh, what do you study? Well Fiona you can study whatever you would like. I know safari guides who have studied accounting, law, art, uh, actuarial science, um, what else? Oh, Environment, obviously, of course, the environmental ones, wildlife management, conservation, all that type of stuff. But uh, the one thing about being a safari guide is as much science as it is, is actually not a science. It's an art. So the most important thing about being a safari guide is actually looking after your guests. You're in an entertainment business. Now, uh, so in terms of qualifications that are legally needed or required, you need to be registered. It, will de it depends on the different countries but you'll have to be registered with your Department of Environment and Tourism and uh, have to have passed some tests to say that you're suitably safe not to get people squashed by elephants. Quickly across to Jamie. I don't believe this. We stumbled right into the middle of a lion hunt. They, this buffalo just came sprinting out of the bushes and behind them is all of the Nkuhuma lionesses, or at least three of them trying to track them down. This buffalo bull is fighting back. And I guess Hyena Road was the good choice and they are hungry and determined. It's worth getting Brent here. We are on, please don't run into me. Look at this, look at them go. She's determinedly chasing him there. She's gonna wear him down. The other lionesses haven't even given her a hand there. She is racing into the bushes. And we've got one two, three lionesses here. This is incredible. They're jogging along. Hold on. Okay, isn't that exciting? Uh, so Jamie's found lions on the hunt. It isn't a bit of a windy signal area. It's a bit of a dodgy area. So we're gonna go give her a hand in that area. Yay! Well done, Jamie! Jamie saved Cat a Day! Brent and Dave failed Cat a Day!
anyway. Oh, yay! Go up here, unmow it. Hold on, hold on. Up and down. But back to Jamie, she's found some signal. So we're gonna go give her a hand in that area. Hyena Road on the eastern side. They are chasing the buffalo, are racing away. They've gone into the drainage line system. And we are gonna lose signal in here, but Brent is on his way. Oh, you're on there, Jandre. In here. They've got it, they've got it, they've got it. Inside my toilet. Okay, we're trying to get there as fast as possible. I'm just gonna have to be on the radio and try not lose Dave. Jamie, um, on Central Junction, Gary Cutline. Uh, confirm I must come to the southern side of Hyena Road or head to the north. Safari. So confirm Nyala right north. Jamie's excited, she's not kidding her mic. I can't hear. Her. Jamie, confirm Nyala Road North. So much excitement when you get these type of sightings. It sounds like they're actually on top of one, so hold on. Hopefully Rusty's got better signal there. Hold on, guys! Dave, you still, oh, Dave's still there. Talking and looking at camera, I really have to concentrate. Quickly, Jamie's got signal. In dramatic sense. You're back, guys. Shit, they've caught the buffalo. This is not for sensitive viewers. We went black screen at the worst possible time, but the lions have caught this buffalo and they are on its back. The two lions have got it from the back. The others are trying to help, but they cannot get round to the front. It keeps fighting back. Oh, this is incredible. This is going to be very difficult for those of you who are sensitive viewers to watch, so please turn off. These audio of this is absolutely unbelievable. I'm scared of repositioning right now, but I am going to try. Okay, we're going to reposition. I'm hoping we don't go black screen. We are right on the edge of a drainage line wall. got to be very, very careful here that we don't get in the way of what's happening. I've jumped on the back of this buffalo. It's a very, very big bull. And there's some serious fight in him here. This could go on for an incredible period of time. And this is what the rawest 
version of wildlife out here is truly like. A firm Brent, I think so. Here comes the fifth lioness. I just need to make sure that we've got an escape route here in case this buffalo comes to us. Okay, I've just arrived now. I can see Jamie's lights. I'm just trying to figure a way into the block. Okay, I can hear that buffalo, so now I've got my sign. Hold on. Hey, Finn. It's a very steep. So you're back across to Jamie. Look at this. This is incredible, guys. We had to move the car out of the way. We found ourselves in a really serious position there with the buffalo running towards us. And we had to, had to get out of his way. He is a 900 kilogram animal that is very, very frightened right now. And we found ourselves in a very difficult position. He was trying to charge the lions that were around us and we had to move. You can see they're trying to get to that hold on the face of his, on the front of his face. This is incredible to witness. It's moments like these that are truly, truly both spectacular and heartrending. They can't get onto the front of the buffalo. Brain to come back, he's fallen into the drainage. Pardon? I'm going to. Okay, we can hear Brent on his way. I cannot believe this is way, the way the afternoon went. This is the last thing we were expecting. He's still fighting back. He's still chasing the lionesses away. Brent is racing back towards the scene because we cannot get down here without rolling the vehicle. If you can get in from there, that'll be your best approach. And moments like these are exceptionally rare. The last time we saw a live buffalo hunt was over a year ago. And now we have the Inkahumas in action in an age-old battle that has been played out for hundreds and hundreds of years. And now they have the advantage. Three lionesses on its back. We're going to go forward a little bit before Brent gets here. Here we go. How's your review there, Jean-André? All of them are on top of it now. They've taken it down and this buffalo has just lost the battle. They need to get to front of its head, they need to grab its neck or the nose, but the fact that they've got it off its feet and on its side... And now comes the difficult part. The sounds of this buffalo is absolutely heart-wrenching. And at the same time, we've become so invested in these lionesses, we know that they have three sets of cubs to feed. And demonstrating why the lion is the apex predator, all five of them working together as a cohesive unit. You can hear Brent on his way. And Buffalo is still fighting to get up. But his battle is lost, and the lionesses have him. And here comes Brent around the side of the drainage line wall. I can't.
can't believe this is the way that the, the evening has gone. Oh, he's up! I don't believe it, he's got up! One powerful push of those legs, a desperate last struggle of a buffalo that is losing this fight. Over to Brent, who has got a different view. So we just managed to get down here. I know this is very disturbing for some people. It looks like all the Ngoma ladies. Now sometimes it can take a long time for a buffalo to die, but this is nature at its most raw. She's gonna go for the nose hold now. That helps quicken the, quicken the death. So what happens is the blood will actually flow back into that buffalo's lungs and, and it'll suffocate on its own blood, but it does make it a bit quicker. You can hear that there now. Um, and the female at the back's already started feeding. That's not uncommon either. This is really hard, but this is nature. Now guys, it seems as though Brent cannot hear final control, but we have this incredible view from up at the top of the drainage line, and I think both of us are just going to keep presenting and we can switch between the vehicles. We've got this view from above. Oh, this hounds of this buffalo. I know this is really hard to watch. It's hard for all of us utterly devastating to see and at the same time you cannot help but admire the power of these cats and the power of their teamwork look at that absolutely incredible as raw as it gets Truly, truly phenomenal to witness. I have seen this go on for over an hour, but slowly but surely, this buffalo is getting weaker and weaker. Okay, guys, let's go and have a look from a different perspective from the head of the buffalo. Okay, look at this, we're right here. We've just repositioned to get a better view here. And you can see the lioness at the back has already started feeding. That's not uncommon. Look at that, see? She's trying really hard now to get that blood flowing into the buffalo's lungs. Oh, see that she just got kicked. So there's still... Look at that. Isn't that incredible? I know this is really sad. I'm just going to keep quiet. Uh, as I keep saying, this is nature at its most raw. Let's go uh, back to see what Jamie's view from the top is. And now we have things from a slightly different perspective. You can hear the desperate breathing of the buffalo. This is one of the hardest sights to witness out here, particularly with such an enormous buffalo bull. And the silence of the evening is just brent, broken by the distress calls. Let's go and have a different look from Brent's perspective. 
And we are, you can see, you can hear that labored breathing, that that blood is now going into the lungs. And you can see the other lionesses aren't too perturbed, and keeping it down now. They're starting to feed. So it is quite a precarious spot where we are. You can see that buffalo is still trying to get out. It's amazing the fight these old buffalo bulls have. Now you can see they're not going for the traditional throat grip. Being females, they're a bit smaller. So with lionesses, without males, quite often the nose hold works better. I know this is really, really difficult for a lot of people to watch, but the lions, as I say, have a lot of cubs to feed. Yeah, he's starting to struggle to breathe as his lungs fill with blood. So it is five minutes towards the end of the show, but we are obviously going to extend because this is incredible. And remember, this is live. This is happening at the, the, right this very second. The Nkuma pride of lions have caught an old dugger boy. Abel, try from where you are now. Come in towards the Shkova from, from where you are. Copy. You can see how the blood is starting to coagulate almost out there and you can see the pink frothiness of that blood is quite a bit of it is coming up from the lungs Now you can see those lionesses have already decided they've started to tuck in. Now, incredible amount of energy is expelled by the lions to bring down an animal of this size. He's still fighting. I'm afraid. For his sake, I think this battle is lost. Oh, let's go across to Jamie. Uh, Candice, go ahead. The 
air is just rent with the sound of this buffalo. I cannot believe how long he has fought for. Truly filled with admiration for these incredible animals. And inc it's both an exhilarating and a heartbreaking sight. These lionesses are doing what they do best. I'm going to send you back over to Brent. We just want to keep giving you a view from an alternate perspective. Okay, we're back down in the drainage. And you can see that buffalo is seriously struggling to breathe now. This is quite, quite difficult to watch, but it shouldn't be too long. I'm just going to try to roll back a little bit to move this section of the vehicle out. Now that they've, oops, sorry, lines, a bit jumpy because of that buffalo. Try to find a better spot. Oh. So while we just try and move quickly, let's go see how Jamie's view from the top. <clears throat> and while Brent changes his position, we still have this extraordinary view. I have never seen a lion hunt from this perspective. And there we go, starting to have that aggression with each other as they get into each other's space. And this will become even more apparent once they, once they have completed their grisly deed and they start to eat the buffalo in earnest. And lions will fight each other for every scrap of meat initially when they first start to feed and these lionesses are hungry. Guys, we are going to, one of us is going to have to give up our position in the sighting relatively soon so that other vehicles can come in. And because of the perspective that I'm in, I think Brent has got a better position. So we will stay here for as long as possible. My arm is starting to shake because the adrenaline is just, <laughs> the adrenaline has just kicked in. This is absolutely extraordinary. Here's Brent repositioning and chatting to Mike. They, getting closer and closer finally to the last moments and you just in this situation you just want it to be over for the poor buffalo the lioness is playing a patient waiting game one of the lionesses taking point at the head Guys, this will be our last perspective from this angle. We have to give up our position in the sighting. We're going to move off and let other vehicles come in. But we're going to send you back over to Brent. No, no. No, Jamie, don't go. Um, unfortunately, this battery is going to last another five minutes at the most on our camera. So um, I think we'll, we'll give up our spot. And it is also Jamie who found them hunting. So maybe this will give Jamie a chance to get down and around to my position before our battery dies. As you can see, that buffalo is feeding on Look at that, that lion is getting kicked in the head, but she's still trying to, still trying to feed. I just got to talk to Jamie quickly. Jamie, confirm you are between the two drainages. Ah, 
I'll go. Um, we'll stay just as long as our, our battery's about to die. So Vernon, you can come take my spot, and then Mikey will be first standing by. Okay, so we're going to stay down here for as long as we can, but our battery is about to die, unfortunately. Look at that. So, I know this can be quite harsh. That they are already feeding. Um, she's actually opening up his stomach at the moment but he's still alive and the other lioness is feeding off his rump Sorry guys, um, there's a, a bit, a bit of... Okay, so guys, also there's obviously a lot of people waiting for this sighting. And we're going to stay as long as we can with the battery. I think Jamie's going to try to reposition to get a better view. And then we're going to have to move out. And let the other guys come in and get a chance. But well done, Jamie. As you can see, she's still holding on. Buffalo. Oh, he's still fighting. I know this is really difficult to watch, guys, but this, as I keep saying, is nature. And those little cubs we love so much are sustained on the milk of this buffalo. I know this is very difficult and I'm just going to keep quiet and, and I know a lot of people might be finding this very difficult but just you've got to look at it with the big circle of life. Oh, sh oh they're really starting to fight over feeding. Those, the breathing is starting to get far more labored. Oh, what's happening? There's a fight. There's something else there. Is it a male lion? Is it a leopard? What happened? That lioness just took off. That lion just took off and chased something. Here come the males. So these male lions are running in here. They've obviously heard this buffalo dying. But the lioness obviously weren't sure whether 
or some of the lionesses are running away. This might not be the Birminghams. Could this be new males, Salati males? Look at this, isn't this amazing? That reaction is it's a bit unusual if this was the Birmingham boys. What's going on? So, sorry, I'm going to just put my spotlight behind me. There's only the lioness who's holding the buffalo down. What? what? Could it be the Birminghams? Could it be new males? Station four of the one side to have run away after those one when it was called only one still in the buffalo. So I'm just keeping quiet. I'm trying to hear so if those males if or when those males arrive. And can you believe it? We can hear Jean Ray singing from here. I think the buffalo has finally, finally died. No. Oh, yes, I think that was just nerves. What happens when you look up and all your sisters and sisters are gone? Look at that face. Any line is this still behind you, Dave, that you can see? Now, this is a great risk for lions when they kill something as big as a buffalo just to have it stolen by some male lions. So our, our battery seems to be surviving for now, but we don't know how long it's going to last. So if we do disappear, we do apologize. Jamie is trying to get around. He has something growling. Oh, look at her claws. One of her claws is caught. So I'm just going to take the spotlight off. I want to see what she's growling at. So Now, that buffalo's distress calls could have brought male lions running in from 10 kilometers away. Oh, sounds like someone's coming back. Ah, oh, one of the lionesses is coming back behind us. So the initial panic is, seems to be over. It could be the Birmingham boys. She's going to walk right next to Dave. And she's going to pop out right in the corner of the camera. And I can hear another one walking in behind me. There's a male, there's a male. Scent marking, so it could possibly be one of the Birmingham boys. I thought I heard two males roaring. So I'm sure he's going to come down. This could be quite spectacular shortly. another set of eyes behind him. So I thought I heard two males.
He's busy scent marking on top of the hill there. Now you can see the lioness who did the killing is panting heavenly. She's not even thinking about eating. She was stuck onto that buffalo's nose for so long. The amount of energy she's expended uh, to, to bring that animal down. It's just incredible. Dave, just tell me what you want. Oh, sorry. Oh, Dave was trying to sign language me and I didn't understand. Is that male? He's still up on top. There he is. Why aren't you charging in here, mister? Have you really got a full belly? Um, Dave, just come back. I want to see something on the other side of the spotlight. See, this lioness has lifted her head. As I said, I thought I heard males coming from the, the northwest as well. I can't see. Oh, he's fighting with one of the lionesses. Here he comes. Yay, free meal. Looks like, definitely looks like one of the Birmingham's. Yep, you just see the scent marking the lioness's reactions to him. He's got such a full belly. So he's not that hungry, that's why he hasn't made such a big deal. Normally a male lion, if he was hungry, he'd run in here and whack the females. I actually think there's a mating pair up on top behind us as well. Let's see, there's something going on behind me again. I can see a lioness in the distance, but I'm not sure if there's a male there as well. See, I heard other males roaring to the north. Oh, he's growling at something. I'm just going to reverse a bit so he can see. You see another male up there, Dave? Oh, there's a big stump. I can't hit that, can I? Oh, oh we can't see anything just yet. Oh, let's just... But he is growling at something up there. So it could be another one of the Birmingham boys. And this just spectacular. We're right in the middle of the African bush, live with the pride of lions that has just taken down a buffalo live. The second ever live buffalo kill on Safari Live. By the same pride, the Inkahuma pride.
Okay, there's three lionesses here. I can I know one's off to my left, so we are still missing one. Oh, there's another male. There's a second male. I thought I heard two males calling. I think that that's the mating pair we might have been tracking this morning. Mm -hmm. And to me it sounds like there might even be more coming from the north. I keep hearing something up there. I can't see anything. I think there's a third male to the north that's coming. Maybe even two. Jamie has certainly saved Cat today. She's going to come take over for me. I said we might disappear at any second. So we've got at the moment I can see one, two, three, four, six different lines. And I still think there's a couple more coming. So we're missing one lioness, and I still think there's some males coming from the north. I just want to see where Jamie is because I'm going to have to move. Jamie, Jamie. What's your position? Jamie, what's your position? Uh, copy, I've got your audio. I'm going to make my way out. Okay, guys, I'm going to make space. My battery's not going to die. Uh, oh, my battery is going to die. Jamie's is not. So we're going to say, wow, and we'll definitely come see these lines again tomorrow. The second ever. The live buffalo kill on Safari Live. Bye, lions. Okay, so wow, wasn't that exciting? Jamie oh, saved a cat today. Oh, there's the fifth lioness. She's just lying off to the right there. There she is. I'm just gonna find my way out of here now. And she happens to be on my road. Well, we'll have to go around her. Oh no, I don't think we can. <laughs> Um, so there's Jamie, she's going in. So from myself and the dangerous dish, what an incredible Saturday sunset, Catterday Safari. So let's jump back board, on board with Jamie as she makes her way back towards those Inkhormans on the kill. What an absolutely incredible afternoon. That has been well and truly one of my most memorable moments in the bush that I have ever experienced. 
And as this is something that we couldn't show you, unfortunately, we didn't have signal, but as Jandre and myself made our way out of that sighting, and I've just realized I've knocked my light up into the sky. Let me just fix that before we go in. Um, as we came out of that sighting, we, I was busy trying to off-road, and this male lion appeared out of nowhere, roaring right next to the car, out of the darkness. I promise you, Jandre and myself both levitated about 20 centimeters into the air. I was about to exaggerate, but I'm not going to. But we really did, we levitated. Because all of a sudden there was just these two males right next to us on either side. I couldn't see anything in the thick bush. It's just been incredible. Okay, let me try and get through here. We're going to be playing a bit of Tetris here with the other vehicles. I don't know if Tetris is the right word, but it certainly feels like Tetris just so that we can get in. So just hold on, bear with me a moment. Brent is trying to get out and there's another vehicle trying to get out as well. You can hear Brent creaking through. Ah, there's a male lion. He's not even feeding, I expected him to be feeding. Oh, well that was unfortunate. <sighs> Sorry, Chandre. Oh, there's so many radios. I'm getting confused. I can't answer Brent. I'm tangled. I'm tangled in my jacket. Oh, no. Okay, there's the male lion, everybody. Standing by. Copy, confirm south of my position now. Okay, copy that, thank you. Uh, should I come back onto the road or keep going from where I am? Oh. Copy that, thank you. There's a um, one of the Ngala here, right in front of me. Whew. Okay, guys, we're going to try and reposition to just get to where Brent has told us we can go. There's, there's another vehicle in my way, and it's really, really tricky to get in. I don't actually know how we're going to, except by moving around. You can come, Tax. I think we'll have to try and go through here. I can't see with this light on. No, it's fine. I've got it. Oh, sorry, guys. Didn't mean to blind you. Thanks so much. Shem, hope you'd got to see us. Yeah, cool, that happened so fast. <laughs> cool. All right, cheers guys, have fun. Thank you. Cheers. All right, let's see how Brent managed to get in here because it's now totally dark. And I can't see where to go, but I want to get to that buffalo. I know we've got the male line here. I think we can do it this way. There we go. Okay, we got it. Oh boy, I'm not hungry. Oh. There's the lioness. And no way to get into the buffalo kill. You can hear them crunching away. I would like to have a chance to get to see the buffalo kill before we end off. We have extended 
As, as you may be able to tell, we have extended our show considerably. But let's try and get to this buffalo carcass. There's just a male lion sort of lying there. That we're going to have to circumnavigate. Brent said go left and there's a big elephant path. But things are very difficult in the dark. But I think if I squeeze through here, I'm going to have to move around the edge of this male. I think this is where Brent meant. You okay there, Jean? Thank you. This must be where Brent meant. If it's not, well, we'll find a way. We'll find a way through here. I know we won't. Where this elephant path is. Absolutely no idea. I can't find it. This is not okay. Okay. We're getting signal here. We're definitely not going to have signal there. I can't see the line. Guys, unfortunately, I think trying to get into this drainage line isn't going to work out for us today, especially with Wendy's signal. We've had the most amazing experience, but I don't think we're going to manage it, unfortunately. And I've also got several vehicles waiting to get into the sighting now. We will be here first thing tomorrow morning to follow up on these lines. I don't know how Brent got in here, and I can't manage it with this line where, lying where he is. He's out. Oh, John Bray's sorry, Bush. I'm sorry, Chandre. There's so much going on, and we have 